Hey, speaking of messes, uh, it reminds me of a story that I heard about a couple who uh, never had a mess. They've been married for 50 years, 50 years, married, celebrating their golden, golden wedding anniversary. They were uh, vacationing 50 years in Jamaica, and a reporter heard of their mess-free marriage, all this peace in their marriage. So a reporter sat down with the husband, the wife, and said, hey, can, can you just give us the secret? Like, what's the secret to a unmessy marriage? So you, you guys said you've never had an argument in the 15 years you've been married. How, how, how can this be true? And he said, well, I can explain it to you right away. I mean, it happened, uh, I can tell you, it, it all stems back to when we had our honeymoon. We decided to go to Arizona to visit the Grand Canyon. And my wife and I, first time we were together, it was an amazing time. Uh, we were just excited to be together. And we get on some horses to go down into the Grand Canyon. My wife is leading the way on her horse. And a few steps into the trail, her horse stumbled a little bit. And she almost fell off the horse. Well, she very quietly got off the horse, walked around to the front of the horse, pointed at the horse and said, that's one. <laughs> got back on the horse rode down about a quarter of a mile. The horse stumbled again. She almost fell off again. She walked, got off the horse, walked back around to the front of the horse, said, that's two. About a half a mile down the trail, horse stumbled again. She almost fell off. This time, very quietly, she reached into her purse, pulled out a revolver, walked around to the front of the horse, shot the horse right in the head. Killed the horse right there. I started freaking out. This husband talked. I freaked out like, what are you doing? I can't believe that you, why in the world would you kill the horse? I mean, just a defenseless animal. She very quietly walked up to me and said, that's one. <laughs> we never argued again. Come on, how many men out there are on number two already? Come on. It's all right. Hey, happy Easter. So glad that you are here today. I think Easter can be summed up in one simple phrase. There is more to this life than just this life. I think it's proved out in what the resurrection is all about. There's more to this life than just this life. Everything about our faith. Everything about the church that has existed for over 2,000 years began on that Sunday with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We celebrate it today. Offices are closed, stock markets closed. The resurrection was the pinnacle of the life of Jesus. Now it's been said that we are an Easter people living in a Good Friday world. Meaning that we spend a lot of time and a lot of effort around the cross. We, we, we love the cross, and the cross is powerful. There, the, the, the death of Jesus, what he, what he, the stripes that he bore on his back. The, the Bible says that, that we were, we, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of his peace was upon him. The brutality of the crucifixion, all that he went through on the cross was, was horrible and horrific. And, and that day, when that Friday, when he, his arms were stretched out, two thieves on each side, and he cries out, it is finished. Let me tell you, the, the finished power of the cross only is because of what he did on Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, he, he, he not only predicted his death, a lot of people died for what they believe in, but only one, <laughs> only one rose from the dead. Only one said, I will rise. Take, take this temple three days destroy this temple, and in three days, I'm gonna rise from the dead. Buddha didn't do it. Muhammad didn't do it. Only Jesus is alive today. Come on, that's a good time to clap right there. <laughs> Only Jesus. And when they went to the tomb, here's the thing. Nobody expected there to be no body. Right? I mean, when people die, they're supposed to die. Like, they ain't supposed to come back. So I want to take you through just a passage of scripture this morning, and I want to talk to you a little bit about what happened at the tomb. Now, if you study the scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are called the Gospels, 
and they explain the life of Jesus. Each one of them has a little different perspective, a little different view. And when it comes to the tomb and what happened around the tomb, we're gonna kind of pull from all of the different gospels. We're gonna focus most of our attention in Mark chapter 16. Beginning in verse one, it says, when the Sabbath was over. Now, let's understand what that means. The Sabbath for Jewish people started on Friday when the sun went down and ended on Saturday when the sun went down. That's how they did their days. They did them sundown to sundown. Now, what happened is, is the Jews had to get Jesus off of the cross and into the tomb before sundown on Friday, day one. They had to get him away because they weren't allowed to work on Friday, on the Sabbath. Now it says, Mary Magdalene, who was a mess, if you don't know the story of Mary Magdalene, you can study it later. She, she was a prostitute. She met Jesus. God turned her mess into a message. I mean, everything changed with her. Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they could embalm him very early on Sunday morning. Okay, so now what does that mean? That means after the Sabbath, which was Saturday at sundown, fast forward to the beginning of Sunday. That's why Jesus died and was raised three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Very early on Sunday morning, as the sun rose, they went to the tomb. They worried out loud. Notice what they said. They were talking on their way. And they said, probably Mary Magdalene said, hey, we got a problem here because there's a stone in front of who will roll back the stone from the tomb for us. Then they looked up and saw that it had been rolled back. It was a huge stone and walked right in. They saw a young man, his angel was there on the right side, dressed all in white. And they were completely taken aback, astonished. And the first thing he said to them is, Hey, don't be afraid. Don't, don't be nervous about this. Don't, don't tremble. I know you're looking for Jesus. I love that phrase. I know you're looking for Jesus. Listen, if you came to church today, if you're watching online, I believe God's saying, you, I know you're looking for Jesus. You've been looking a lot of, in a lot of different places, but you're, you're looking, you're in the right place. The one they nailed on the cross, he's been raised up. He, he's here no longer. You can see for yourselves that, I love this phrase, the place is, say it with me, Empty. One more time. The place is empty. Now on your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going on ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there exactly as he said. They got out there as fast as they could. I'd probably leave quick too. Beside themselves, their heads swimming, stunned, they said nothing to anyone. A couple things here that jump out at me. Mary, Mary, and Salome go to the tomb and the first question that they ask is who's going to roll the stone away now if you look at all the four gospels there wasn't just a stone to be dealt with and this represented an obstacle and I believe we all face obstacles when we come to Jesus no matter where you are on this journey I I don't care if you're here because you know your family brought you and and you really just want a free meal and so you showed up and and they're going to take you out to eat and you're kind of suffering church so you can get a free lunch this afternoon I don't know if that's you. That might be you. I don't know. Or maybe you're here kind of kicking the tires of Christianity. Maybe you grew up in church and this is the first time you've been back in a long time. Or maybe you've been around for a long time. We all face obstacles between us and what Jesus has for us. But there were actually three different ones here at the tomb. First was the stone, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But there was also a seal that the Roman guard would put over the tomb. So they would put a rock in front of it, a stone in front of it, but then they would put a seal to make sure that nobody got in. And specifically for Jesus, because of what he said, the Jews made sure that the Romans put a seal over it because they were afraid that somebody was gonna steal his body so they could, everybody could say that he rose from the dead. Not only that, they put soldiers all around. So, so you've got three things here, three obstacles that mean something different, each one of them, a stone, a seal, and some soldiers. Let's talk about the stone. The stone represents a barrier, an obstacle that we face. Maybe it's just in our mind. Maybe it's a physical thing that's stopping us. I think our biggest obstacle, to be honest, and I dealt with this when I came to Christ, when I was kind of going through that process of coming to become a Christian, going to church and all that stuff. I wasn't a church person, is fear. Fear is a big obstacle. Fear of what? I think the biggest thing is fear of losing stuff, like the fear of loss. 
about six years ago, my wife and I went to a, um, um, a dinner to raise money at this friend of ours restaurant. <clears throat> and they had these tables out everywhere. And we go and sit at this table and we were by ourselves. We didn't have any, no many people there. We love those kind of events. And we sit down and there's a guy sitting at our table whom if, I, I know now, if I said his name to you, you would know him. He was like a, a celebrity in Charlotte, Charlotte celebrity. If I said his name, everybody, if you've been around Charlotte for any length of time, you know exactly who I'm talking about. And he was a little outspoken. I could tell he'd not just had three glasses of wine. He may have had three bottles of wine. And, and he started flirting with my wife, which was hilarious. It was so funny because he didn't have a chance. Like there was no way that it was gonna happen in a million years. Like it wasn't gonna, this wasn't happening. I was just sitting back enjoying the show. I felt like I was just watching. It was so funny. I'm not a jealous husband, but this was hilarious. Like he's trying to work as hard as he can, thinking something, and she's kind of playing into it until he says, what do y'all do? And we said, we're pastors. And he goes, uh-oh, whoa, hold on a second. It's amazing how sober you become when somebody talks of talking about pastors. <laughs> and he goes, you're pastors, I like you. And, I, I just, and he told me, he goes, I like her a little bit more than you, but just being honest. He goes, I think I wanna come to your church. Now, I didn't know if it was the wine talking, but I gave him my phone number. I got his phone number, invited him to church, and that weekend, he showed up to church, sat on the front row, tears streaming down his face. He didn't know what happened. We went out to lunch after. He goes, I don't know what happened in there. I've never experienced anything like this in my life. I said, that's called the presence of God. That's called the Holy Spirit. He touched your life. He goes, I, I like you. I like you guys, I like your church, I love the music, I thought you were a great communicator, I thought it was a lot of fun, but this whole Jesus thing, I don't know. See, you know why? Because he was afraid to lose something. He had a lot. He thought that he was gonna have to give up a lot in order to come to Jesus. I know for me, what I thought I was gonna have to lose is my identity. I mean, just being honest, most of the Christians I knew when I got, became a Christian were weird. They were odd, irrelevant. I'm like, if you want me to be like that, God, no, I'm not getting into this. But see, that's not, that's not, that's so far from the truth. It says there was a seal, seal on the tomb. The seal represents that, that stamp that many of us live under. It's that seal of you're always gonna be this, a failure. You're always gonna be identified with this mistake that you made. You're always gonna, your life is gonna be built around this decision that you made. You've been stamped with this. Maybe, maybe it's, you're always gonna live in this neighborhood. You're always gonna be poor like your whole family has been. You're always, you're never gonna go to college. There's no way, nobody in your family, that stamp, that seal of your fate, that, that's what it feels like. When I became a Christian, I went to my mom because I was pretty radical about my faith. And I started talking to my mom and my mom said something to me that, that spoke volumes about this idea of being stamped. I said, hey, why don't you come to church with me? And she goes, no, 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 I can't come to church. Now, if you know my story, uh, I grew up, my mom dealt drugs for the most of her life. She, she sold drugs, she was involved in drugs. So I grew up in that environment. So I started drinking and doing drugs at a very, very young age. And that was my life until I became a Christian. Literally, when I was 21 years old is when God delivered me from all of that. And then my mom was still in it. So I went back into that and trying to help her. And here's what she said. She goes, I, 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 there's no way I could come to church. I'm not good enough. She felt that she had to change her life in order to get involved with God. In order to approach Jesus, she had to get her life good. And the truth is, is you don't get good and come to God. You come to God and he'll get you good. That's how he works. <laughs> soldiers. And most of the pictures we see around the tomb is usually just two soldiers, but historians tell us there were 16 soldiers all around the tomb. And each one, them, each one of them was responsible for six feet around them, and they were not allowed to sleep, sit, or lean on anything. If one of them fell asleep, all 16 of them were, were executed. One of them. 
And so they're standing there, and the Bible tells us, what's so cool about this, the Bible tells us when the angel showed up, this is in Matthew chapter 28, you can read about it later, when the angel showed up, all of the soldiers passed out, like they just, God knocked them out. What do they represent? They represent those people in our life that can come between us and Jesus. And not, not even so much the people sometimes, maybe it's a family member, and the minute that you start talking about your relationship with God, they go, yeah, but I know you. There's no way, I don't care how powerful God is, he ain't gonna change you. Who do you think you are? You know our family. It could be the words that people have spoken. They're gone, but we're still held captive by those words. The stone, the seal, and the soldiers. But I love what happened because when they showed up, they looked up and saw that it had been rolled away. So here's the thing, look at me, everybody, look at me. The thing is, is you don't have to worry about the stone, the seal, and the soldiers because Jesus already took, took them for you. He already dealt with them before you even got there. You don't have to be concerned about that obstacle, that barrier that's between you and Jesus. You don't have to be worried about that stamp that's over your life. He's torn away the seal. You don't have to worry about those words that have been spoken over you because they have been removed. The power of those words through the power of Jesus Christ, because that place is empty, God can change everything. There is nothing between you and him. There is nothing between, he's taken care of all of it. When he walked into the tomb, I love what the angel said. The angel said to him, the place is empty. Empty. Look around, there's nobody here. I know you're looking for Jesus, but he's not here. Why was the tomb empty? So you don't have to be. You don't have to be empty. You don't have to live an empty life. Even though we perceive that we have to give something up, the truth is whatever we think we give up, God replaces it with so much better. That fear that we let go, you know what? He gives us peace in place of it. He gives us joy. He gives us hope in place of it. He gives us everything that we need in place of that fear, that, that anxiety, that depression, that hopelessness. And the greatest thing has been emptied of its power, and that's sin. Sin, missing the mark, that mis those mistakes that we make over and over in our life. I love what that young lady said on, on, the, uh, uh, on the video. She said, you know, a messy life means I, I keep trying to do the right thing, but I end up doing the wrong thing. I think we've all been there, haven't we? Sin. And see, that's what Easter is all about. That's what the resurrection is all about, is the truth that Jesus paid it all. Why would you want to pay for something that somebody already paid for you? Think about it. Have you ever had anybody pay for a meal for you? I love it. <laughs> I'm available for lunch. <laughs> Just saying. Nothing better. But, you know, there's something different that goes off in your head. Because when, especially if they tell you in advance, right? Like if they tell you in advance that they're going to pay for your meal, what ends up happening is you typically will not order what you would normally order because they're paying for the meal, right? I know some of y'all aren't like that, but most of you are. <laughs> if you didn't know, like if they didn't tell you in advance, you'd be ordering appetizers and a salad. I know me, I'm thinking two or three days out, maybe I could order this and then have this on Wednesday and Thursday if I freeze this. <laughs> Brought my own bags with me, my own Tupperware with me. Come on. <laughs> See, here's the thing. Some of us in this place, we, we continue to pay the price that's already been paid for us. It's already been paid. Why would you pay a bill that's already been paid? You, wouldn't, you would never, somebody paid your bill, you would never, ever, ever go back to the waitress and say, hey, listen, listen, can I go ahead and pay this again? but yet that's how we treat what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago. The great thing is we can order all that we want. And for some of us, our table is full. We have a lot of mistakes. There's a lot of things that stand between us and God. One last phrase, and then I'm done. Maybe have the worship team come out. One last phrase. The angels said, to, the angel said to Mary and Mary and Salome, she said, 
Go tell the disciples and Peter. I love that. Why, why did the angel say that? Why did the angel say, go tell the disciples and Peter? Well, if you go back a little bit, Peter, one of the 12 disciples, was like the chief mistake maker during his time with Jesus. And specifically at the end, Jesus even told him, he said, you're gonna deny me three times. And he argued with Jesus. Like, no, I'm not. Man, I love you. You're my best friend. I'm, I would never, I'll die with you. But you know what happened? He didn't. As he was following Jesus, when he was arrested, the Bible tells us a young girl came to him and said, hey, you're, you're one of the guys that followed. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Could you imagine what it felt like with him to say that? It's just like us. See, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna live that way. But then we do it. Happened again. As he followed Jesus, he was standing around a fire and another young girl says, hey, the way you talk, you sound like a Galilean, just like one of those guys. Are you a follower of Jesus? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. You can sure, I can assure you that Peter, as he's standing there, he's thinking about the words that Jesus said. You're gonna deny me. And thinking, why in the world? Man, why would I do that? I'm not gonna do it the third time. And the Bible says the third time. Peter denies him. And then there's an interesting thing that happens. The scriptures say that Jesus, as he's being arrested, turns and looks at Peter. I wonder what that look felt like for Peter. Because I know that it was not a look of disgust. Like I'm angry with you. No, it was a look of, I'm getting ready to pay your price. I'm getting ready to pay for your meal. I'm getting ready to take care of all the problems that you've had, Peter. I knew you were gonna do this. I even told you you were gonna do it. You did it, but I still love you. Go tell the disciples and Peter. Maybe you're the and blank. Maybe you're the one that needs to fill in your name because I believe the Spirit of God is here for you today, for you. Why don't you stand up on your feet with me? Grab somebody's hand beside you if you could. Father, thank you for today. Thank you that we get to celebrate the amazing resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just bow your head and close your eyes just for a second. If you're watching online and you can, just close your eyes. If you're in overflow, just, just take a second, close your eyes right where you are. Father, thank you for your presence that's in this place. Thank you that you did rise from the dead. You're not, you're not in the tomb, you're not dead, you're alive. You're sitting at the right hand of the Father right now. And God, our hearts are open to you. Our hearts are open to you. If you're here in this place and maybe you've got some obstacles between you and Jesus, perceived or real, maybe you've been stamped and there's a seal that you need to be torn away. Maybe, maybe there's some words or people or people that said words over you that have been holding you captive from the freedom that Jesus paid for. Let me tell you today, he'll remove it all. Whether it's the first time or maybe you knew God at one time in your life, Today's the day where God can change everything. Look, don't just treat this as some kind of holiday, but treat this as a moment in the presence of Almighty God, the creator of the universe, who says he loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. And he sent his son, he didn't, he, he didn't tell his son to go, he asked his son, and his son willingly went for you and me, laid down his life for you and me he was raised from the dead and the power of that resurrection is here to set you free today whom the sun sets free is free indeed if you want to start a relationship with Jesus a brand new relationship maybe you've never prayed a prayer of accepting him becoming a follower of Jesus maybe you've been a fan of Jesus for a long time but today's the day where you become a follower of him or maybe you knew him at one time and you fell away. You let the obstacles take the place of your relationship. Maybe for fear of loss, like my friend. Today, you can have that all wiped away, all removed, and let our heavenly Father come in through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He's here today. If you say, yeah, that's me. I wanna know that I have an eternal home in heaven. 
I want to start a brand new life with Jesus Christ. I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, whether you're watching online, in the lobby, in overflow, or in this room, I just simply want you to do one thing. Just squeeze the person's hand beside you. Just squeeze their hand. If you say, that's me, I want to start that relationship. Just squeeze that hand. You can do it. Don't hesitate. See, if you start thinking about it, you start putting obstacles. Well, this and that and this and that. No, no, just take the step today. Take the step. You ready? One, don't hesitate. Just slightly squeeze that person's hand. Two, make that decision today. Three, just squeeze their hand. Just squeeze their hand. Just ever so slight, squeeze it. If somebody squeezed your hand, I want you to do something for me. Just help them today. Would you just lift their hand up right now? Lift it up high. Lift it up high. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Hands all, keep it up. Pray this prayer out loud. Say it with me all across this church, even in the overflow. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that his blood was shed for my forgiveness. Today, this moment, this second, I am completely free from the power of sin. Every mistake, every sin has been washed away. I get to start over today. Thank you, Lord. I will worship you and I will serve you all the days of my life in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Can we give God just a big hand clap today? Isn't that fantastic? Come on, you could do better than that. Come on, let's just thank him for that. Awesome.